Luftwaffe JG2 A Soberleutnant, Paul Temi. Produced by, Azizbiz.com. Jagdgeschwader yeah, 2 Richthofen. Was named after the famed World War I, ace, Manfred von Richthofen. This gave rise to JG2's emblem, which used a white shield, with a red letter R to signify their unit, this would become a synonymous symbol which was used to represent the unit throughout World War II. On 10 May 1940 Lieutenant Paul Temme was assigned to stab 1st Group JG2. After the declaration of war by Britain and France, Hitler, ordered full gelb, or case yellow, and in five days, Paul Temme had scored his first official kill. By shooting down a French Air Force twin-engined, Potaz 63, south of Sedan, in the Ardennes region. On 26 May, Adolf Hitler, lifted a halt order on Dunkirk allowing Field Marshal von Kleist's armoured group to advance. They captured Calais and by the end of the day were within artillery range of Dunkirk. The Luftwaffe played a major role and it's estimated they dispatched around 600 to 800 aircraft, including both bombers and fighters to the Dunkirk area, as part of their effort to support the German ground forces. The RAF in turn sent around 180 to 200 fighters, which included both Spitfires and Hurricanes, to provide air support for the evacuation of the Allied troops. These aircraft were part of Fighter Command's 11th Group, which included 19 Squadron, 66 Squadron, 72 Squadron, 79 Squadron, and 222 Squadron. Despite being significantly outnumbered, the RAF fighters were able to effectively disrupt the German air operations and prevented them from achieving air superiority over the Dunkirk area. Although difficult to determine due to conflicting reports and incomplete records, it's estimates that the RAF lost around 40 to 45 aircraft defending the area, whilst the Luftwaffe lost around 48 to 55 aircraft on that day, including both fighters and bombers. Overall, the aerial combat that day was an intense battle and costly for both sides, with significant losses suffered by the RAF and the Luftwaffe. It was on this day that Paul Temme managed to shoot down two aircraft, both Spitfires, southwest of Calais. The first one he shot down during a morning sortie at 9.36 a.m., and the second one was shot down later in the afternoon at 5.05 p.m. This brought his tally to three confirmed kills. It's not historically clear but the series of photos shows Lieutenant Paul Temme sitting on a BF-109E3, with the running dog emblem painted on the cowling and marked white 5. Some historians believe that this force-landed aircraft may well have been assigned to him. However the group's records are sketchy at best during this period, and there is no official record of him being shot down or having had a forced landing. The close-up photos are valuable because they show the Christmas tree paint scheme used by his unit at the time. It's estimated that around 22,000 Allied troops were killed in the Battle of Dunkirk. And it was during this time that Paul Temme had something of a spiritual awakening. Shooting down an aircraft is one thing, but mass killing is another. The sensitive, highly strung Paul Temme said, As far as the enemy was until then, a thing, not a person. We shot at an aircraft with no thought for the men inside it. But now we had the job of ground strafing. I hated, danke, it was just, an adulterated, killing. The beaches were jammed full of soldiers. I went up and down at 300 feet, who was a piping, the beach area, cold-blooded, point blank, murder. Defenseless men, fathers, sons, and brothers, being cruelly massacred by a 24-year-old boy. On 27 May the British evacuation started in earnest. The trap troops on Dunkirk was a plump target. The Royal Air Force began a supreme effort to ward off the Luftwaffe attacks, an effort which to last as long as the evacuation went on. The Luftwaffe by now fully aware of the British plans to withdraw dispatched a large bomber force with escorts to hold the withdrawal. They bombed the docks town and along with the oil storage tanks, west of the harbour, setting everything ablaze, while the escorting fighters, strafed the beach area killing as many troops as they could. The bombing caused many fires, which lit up the dawn sky and blanketed the area in thick smoke which could be seen for miles. 
Fighter Command ordered 16 squadrons to cover the area as continuously from 5 o'clock in the morning till nightfall, and most of them on this day carried out two or even three patrols, which varied in size, from 20 aircraft to only nine. They nearly always met the enemy in far greater strength. Six hundred and eleven auxiliary squadrons James McComb was set upon by a vast number of BF 109s, but they held their own. However, RAF 54 squadrons Aldea was shot down over Groveline and had to make the 15-mile trek back to British lines, and eventually would make it back to Dover. Eleven aircraft of RAF 74 squadron fought ten bombers and twenty fighters while. Five of RAF 145 squadron fought 12 bombers and a large formation of fighters, nine of RAF 601 squadron engaged 10 bombers and 20 fighters, and about 7 o'clock in the evening, 20 aircraft from RAF 56 and 610 squadrons battled with an enemy fighter force, twice their number. Fourteen RAF Spitfires and Hurricanes failed to return from covering the evacuation area. The Luftwaffe in error claimed 90 RAF aircraft shot down that day. However, the raid did come with a cost, the Luftwaffe suffered a 10% loss ratio. Out of the 225 bombers they to sent over 24 were shot down. The Luftwaffe lost around 38 aircraft, while the RAF lost a total of 20 aircraft that day. It was on the 2nd August, and after the fall of France, that the newly promoted Paul Temmy who was now a Oberstleutnant, equivalent to a Lieutenant Colonel, was in the process of moving, to a new airfield in Le Havre, France. When he and his wingman, stumbled upon a Bristol Blenheim, from RAF 139 Squadron. For Paul it was a case of being in the right place at the right time. This would become his fourth confirmed kill when the Blenheim crashed in flames, just north of Le Havre, at 11.05 am, close to his new airfield. Being proud of his victory, he later visited the crash site and kept a fragment of the aircraft as a souvenir. It was later, when he saw the photos and letters in the young pilot's wallet, that he realized what he'd done. It was no longer an object, but a young man similar to himself. This affected him deeply. On 11th of August, 1940, Paul Temme scored his fifth victory, a RAF hurricane, shot down at 11.37 am southeast of Portsmouth, England. This made him an ace. The aerial battle that day, gave the RAF, an indication of what was to come in the next few weeks that followed. The attack on the Luftwaffe formation, that was heading towards the Portland naval base, and Weymouth, was the biggest of the day. It caused the destruction of a number of factories, including the gas works and oil storage tanks. Other damage was fairly minor and was really more of nuisance than of value. However in terms of aircraft the day's losses were high on both sides. The Luftwaffe lost a total of 38 aircraft. Further to that some 15 aircraft either made forced landings or made it back to their bases with considerable sustained damage. The RAF fared no better with six Spitfires, and 21 Hurricanes shot down. One Spitfire and five Hurricanes had to make forced landings, and one Spitfire, and nine Hurricanes damaged. 
This did not please fighter commander especially Keith Park, and when they were informed that 26 RAF pilots were missing, something had to be done. On 12 August 1940, JG-2 was given a strategic job of drawing the RAF fighters away from the bombers which were to attack Portsmouth and the Ventnor radar station on the Isle of Wight. As Paul Tammy later recalled, We had strict orders to tee down the British RAF fighters come but May for 35 minutes. No quitting before that time. RAF radar station at Ventnor, located on the Isle of Wight picked up the approaching German formations around noon. JG-2 first clashed with RAF fighters over the sea, south of Portland. The coffee grinder had started. Round and round they went. From 20,000 feet, down to sea level. It was a nightmare, of snap shooting and near collisions. One Spitfire dived at Paul head on. Paul quickly fired, then banged the stick forward. Negative G, sent dust flying up from the floor, into his eyes. Then two hurricanes set on him, and there were still ten minutes to go. Paul had to stay with them, and it needed all his willpower to do so. He swung this way and that, in a series of violent telly curves. Luckily there was scattered cloud which gave him some respite, otherwise the more nimble hurricanes, might have got him. When Paul landed back at Beaumont La Roger, he was all in. Mechanics, heaved him out of the cockpit, and he flopped onto the grass next to, Helmut Wick, JG2's rising star. Wick was too exhausted, to speak. He had had a Herculean combat, and claimed three of the 22 British fighters, that JG2 believed they'd shot down that day. But in a furious combat like that, the counting went all awry. Two or three pilots, might claim the same enemy aircraft. It happened on both sides. Along the 300-mile, air front, from Harwich Viad over to Portland, 32 British fighters were lost. The German news bulletin claimed 90 RAF aircraft shot down, and admitted the loss of 26 of their own. But the Luftwaffe Quartermaster General at least had to be realistic, and wrote off 38 machines. Paul Temme and his friends were fortunate that they stayed in a French chateau near Fécamp. However Paul, felt uneasy that night, and even Helmut Wick was rather depressed at the thought of having shot down a Ju-88 in error. Paul and Helmut Wick talked despondently until 10 a.m. when Wick suddenly stood up, smashed his glass into the fireplace, and then stalked off to his room. Paul tried to sleep on a sofa in the library but it was too uncomfortable. So he sat up and wrote to his mother, but frustrated, he then tore up the letter. His eye had fallen on a book, the poems of Rainer Maria Rilke. He opened it, at random page, and read. We am on weint in the nacht, rein für mich die. Who now weeps in the night, weeps for me. Paul felt a terrible loneliness, as if the sorrows of the world were weighing on his heart. The night before his fateful mission Paul Temme was JG2's group adjutant and at 5 p.m. they received a signal from OKM Luftflotten. It read, Adlet Dag. Eagle Day begins at 7.30 a.m. 13th of August. 13th of August 1940, Adlet Dag. The Luftwaffe offensive designed to destroy England. The mission summary report follows. The day started with fog, and this literary threw a spanner in the works. Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring decides at the last minute to postpone Operation Adler Angriff. However, Göring had waited too long to postpone the operation, while he was able to stop some formations. Other formations were already in the air on their way to their targets. Rather than an overpowering start, he'd wished for, a confusing series of disjointed attacks on random targets had begun. Paul Temme was flying his JG-2's group assigned mission, which was to escort the bombers. It was on this fateful day, the 13th of August, 1940 that he scored his sixth and final victory of the war, a spitfire over England. Moments later he too would be shot down. It's not exactly clear why Paul's aircraft began having engine problems, but he got left behind by the rest of his unit. He saw a lone straggling Junkers Ju-88, and went to its aid but was shot down in the process. 
It's believed that he was shot down by RAF Hurricane Pilot, Sergeant J.P. Mills, of 43 Squadron, based out of Tangmere. Paul Temme opted to barely land his aircraft, and made a forced landing at New Salt's farm, in a field beside Shoreham Aerodrome, in Sussex. When searched Paul Temme was found to have a tin of chocolate containing 2% caffeine, and 8 pervitin pills which were meant to strengthen resolve if the pilot came down in the sea. His aircraft was well photographed and was put on public display to raise money for the British war effort. This ended Paul Temme flying career for the Luftwaffe, and he was later sent to Canada as a POW. He was eventually released, after the war, and would eventually pass away on 29 March, 1998.